Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, the way the world changes was often war. Today, peace. Peace is the father of everything. Think of the end of the World War I with the fall of the Romanovs, the Habsburgs, and the Hohenzollerns. It was about more than dynasties. A new era dawned with Soviet communism and with the emergence of democracies. The last 30 years saw real dramatic changes, revolutions, without revolutions in the classic sense of violent uprisings. Revolutions without revolutions. The implosion of the Soviet Union and the rise of China, the expansion of the European Union into an institution that brought together 27 countries and 450 million people, the reunification of Germany did not require an uprising. Suddenly, it happened. Today, Russia is only a regional power representing 3% of the world economy. China is the world's, world's first economy in purchasing power parity terms. The United States is still a strong economic and even more military power, but the imperial is gone and they no longer want to be it themselves, consumed as they are by internal tensions that greatly erode self-confidence. In China, there is a nostalgia for the greatness of centuries ago and the pride or arrogance of the new wealth. In the United States, there is a nostalgia for the greatness of the day before yesterday without a desire to make any more sacrifices. The European Union has no nostalgia for the colonial empires and many regrets about of many regret about the European civil wars, but we still fail to properly define our place in the world. But everyone, by the way, is searching for their place. My first question, does the West still exist? A question that Henry Kissinger asked me, does the West still exist? The West has had to experience shocks. Under President Trump, NATO solidarity in the event of external aggression was questioned. President Biden heralded a return to classic transatlantic solidarity. But the European Union lost much, much of its trust in the United States because of the volatility of the American policy over the past 20 years. It is, of course, very happy with the return of its greatest partner and friend, but it, the European Union, it now speaks without complexes about strategic autonomy, about European sovereignty. The West was born out of fear of communism, but the latter no longer exists ideologically. The West is looking for a new enemy. For some, it is Russia, for others, China, for still others, radical Islamism, or all the three of them. Ladies and gentlemen, the Cold War is over. The current nature of the geopolitical tensions is different from those before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Less left-right ideological rift, but more economic rivalry. After all, communism is dead, but not the Communist Party of China. The new battleground is often portrayed as a competition between democracies and authoritarianism, a battle of narratives with an ideological undercurrent. However, there are authoritarian regimes that are anti-Chinese, like Vietnam, and there are democ democracies that are pro-Chinese, like Pakistan. Democracy is under assault also from inside democratic countries. Unfortunately, this sounds familiar to Europeans and now as well as to Americans, for sure, after January the 6th. 
This rivalry between the US and China, this competition between democracy and authoritarianism does not lead to bipolarity or a G2. No single power controls the world, either economically or militarily. Today, there is more multipolarity, or I prefer the term apolarity, without a polar. In my view, it will not lead all this to a new war, as some historians fear, basing themselves on the Thucydides trap in Greek, Thucydides, in which an old superpower is not prepared to give up its place to a new rising star. Athens that fought Sparta at the time for this reason. In my view, there are no laws in history. Every time is different. And human sciences should not seek too many comparisons with natural sciences. In the world of man, everything flows. Everything flows. A profound difference with the Cold War is that globalization has created over decades a strong economic interdependence between the global actors. And this is in stark contrast to the Cold War, where the Soviet Union and the USA hardly had any economic ties. In this new world, by the way, everyone is looking, as I said, for their place. Everyone. It is the time of sliding panels, sliding panels. A globalization in so many domains, trade, financial flows, internet, culture, sports, entertainment, diseases. So a globalization in so many domains without global governance anymore. The world is becoming more unified in ways of life, but unity itself is further away than ever. The multilateral order has become disorderly with occasional exceptions, for instance, the Paris Agreements, the Paris Accords on climate change. Fortunately, there is more peace unless in a number of places, especially in the Middle East and North Africa. We talk, instead of real wars, we talk about trade wars and cyber attacks. The globalization of the economy and enormous interdependence has meant that war is almost no longer an option. The supply chains are so closely linked that we need each other even if we don't like each other. Sometimes the former is more lasting than the latter. Let us not forget that peace in Europe also came about by intertwining the economies. Peace thanks to the economy. And the same thing is now happening on a global scale. Of course, we know that there are no final achievements in history, I know. And of course, we must not become sleepwalkers, I know. There is peace, but there is no trust between global actors. One reason for that lack of trust is violations of international law and cyber attacks on Western countries to undermine democratic elections and destabilize countries. There is no trust because there is nationalism, often nostalgic nationalism, or folding back on oneself. Relations in the world are now mainly economic. The EU is a global actor. But I admit it is not a world power because it lacks that military arm. The EU is not a military alliance and it was even built against the very idea of power politics. I do wonder what results military interventions have led to. Look at what happened in Afghanistan with the United States and the Soviet Union. Look what happened in Vietnam, in Iraq. Look what happened in Libya with the European Union, by the way. There has been, of course, there has been the military annexation of Crimea. But most of the time, military interventions 
led nowhere. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the balance of power in the world is primarily economic, as I said. China could never play this geopolitical role without having developed its economic power. It's already the world's largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity. Of course, it has also greatly expanded its military power and expenditures. Although it's, it's, it's still far behind the United States. Just to give you a few figures. United States defense budget, 684 billion versus in China, 181 billion in 2019 or 210 billion in 2021. So 680 against 210. The European countries on, on aggregate, including the UK this time, even spent more on defense, 290 billion. I recall China, 210. But the fragmentation of the military equipment market of the member states prevents that this spending is translated into real military power. The US has one main battle tank in you, and in Europe, we are currently operate 16, 16 different types. The permanent structure cooperation, what we call PESCO in our language, the European Defense Agency and the European Defense Fund aim for change. There are new security issues to be addressed like space and cyberspace. And especially Russia has become very active in this field, targeting not only commercial secrets, but also our democracies. Another question, how is economic globalization going? There is not much the US and China see eye to eye on these days, but they do seem to agree on this. Each should need the other a little less. The same can be said of the European Union, which also wants to be less dependent on China and the US and its gigantic tech companies. Supply chains will also be revised as the three major global players move toward respectively technological self-sufficiency, China, strategic autonomy, the European Union, or by America, United States. It also appears that major global companies are keen on diversifying their risk. For example, it is reported that Apple intends to boost production of key products outside of China, and especially in Vietnam and India. China itself is striving to become less dependent on foreign trade and investment, the two drivers of their economic growth for the last 40 years. This strategy is called dual circulation with more emphasis than before on domestic demand, inner circulation, and less one-sidedly focused on exports, out of circulation. Since the great financial crisis, trading goods has grown largely in line with world gross domestic product, GDP, and not faster. And this is unusual. In the decades before, the financial crisis, before the financial crisis, trade grew twice as fast as world GDP, twice as fast. So the high point of globalization is certainly behind us. But no one can escape global interdependence. The European Union is strongly against protectionism. And that is why it concludes free trade agreements with as many countries as Japan, 2019, Vietnam, Singapore, Mercosur, Brazil and Argentina, Korea, and so on. That's why we are negotiating with Australia. And we just concluded an in principle investment agreement with China against the wishes of the new US administration. However, given the current tensions between the EU and China, rapid ratification is out of the question. Sometimes it is a narrow path between protecting your own interests 
and avoiding protectionism. I admit that. The EU, nevertheless, must continue to present itself as a defender of multilateralism and rule-based trade, but without what the French would call naivete, without naivete. We are in favor of free and fair trade, but you need both, not only free, but also fair. You need a level playing field. We remain overwhelmingly opposed to trade wars and protectionism. That's clear. Two recent policy papers of the Commission on multilateralism and the new trade policy confirm this trend. Let me zoom in on our relationship with China. I already spoke about it. Without a free trade agreement, trade with China developed in such a way that China has become, after Brexit, our largest trading partner in 2020, before the US and before the UK. Among European countries, Germany is the most important in terms of trade and investment. Our relationship with China is very diverse and also complex. China is a partner, climate change, Paris Accords, the Iran nuclear deal. China is a competitor, in also in new areas of competition in cyberspace, in artificial intelligence, in biotechnology. And China is a systemic rival when it comes to values and to global governance. The EU's attitude towards China is inspired by these three components, but also by a double approach, firmness and dialogue. Firm on our principles, but always ready to, for dialogue and cooperation. And the third component, after firmness and dialogue, is strategic autonomy. It's a new guiding principle of our foreign policy, European foreign policy. This will make the EU much less dependent on other global actors in many areas, such as technology, energy, defense, migration, battery cells, microprocessor chips, medical material, and so forth, and so forth. The EU does not want to keep the US and China at an equal distance. For that, the ties with the US, especially with the current president, are too strong. In reinvigorating re the transatlantic alliance, the US and the EU can cooperate on political, security, and economic China issues, defending, for instance, the principles of fair and rules-based trade. But the EU itself decides where we work together and where we do not. The time of, again, what the French would call suivisme, just following, is long gone, is long over. The EU does not want to be drawn into a new Cold War of great power rivalry or a policy of decoupling economies and isolationism. One reason, of course, is China's economic importance for the European Union. But again, I want to add nuances. Let us look at the figures. We are not on the whole as dependent on China as many think. For instance, only 7% of German exports of goods go to China. And Germany is the biggest European exporter to China. In terms of added value, German exports to China in 2015 represented 2.8% of the total added value of its exports. What about global Europe? The European Union already today plays a role in the world, in world politics, through the instruments it has regarding our trade, our free trade agreements on all continents. We play a big role due to the, the euro, the world's second payments currency, and perhaps, perhaps soon also an investment product as a result of the issuance of European bonds. We play a world role on climate change. We play a, 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 a big role due to our single market, the largest in the world. Through our development aid, half of the world's uh, development aid, and through our foreign direct investments. 
And I give you a few figures to, to make that clear. Let me recall that in the six years between 2013 and 2018, the EU provided 410 billion in official development assistance worldwide, compared to China, 34. 410 against 34. Even under China's flagship Belt and Road Initiative, uh, funded by public debt, not grants, stood at 464 billion estimated by the World Bank. Only in development aid, we are providing as a European Union 410. The EU is by far the largest source of foreign direct investment with a total stock of 11 trillion compared to China 1.9 trillion, 10 times more. The EU has been and remains a connectivity superpower, both at home and abroad. But we do not need to think of ourselves in these terms and draw on these strengths to frame and execute a strategic approach. Working with the private sector, the EU development banks and other public financial institutions and the EU member states. The Union is not sufficiently conscious of on how strong a global economic player it is for many years already. The internal market, as I said, is the largest in the world. Anyone who wants to sell goods or services here needs to abide by European rules because they are extremely strict and well enforced. I'm referring to the so-called Brussels effect. In those rules, European values are enshrined, such as provisions on climate change, good governance and human rights. Companies from Asia to Latin America beg their governments to copy EU rules so that they won't face multiple regulatory regimes. Europe can only play a real geopolitical role if it has sufficient strategic autonomy. And in this regard, digital dependence is a real handicap. Ladies and gentlemen, among the 15 largest digital companies in the world, there is not a single European one. There is still a lot of work to be done here. It's an understatement. The current European Commission is determined to win the battle for industrial data after we lost it for personal data. The new digital legislation pending in Parliament should also give us another regulatory grip around the companies operating in our territory and restore a level playing field among all digital companies. They will also have to pay taxes here. Digital sovereignty is an absolute requirement. In general, a country or an entity is only autonomous if it is competitive. We can only do the latter if we join forces. In today's world, size matters, scale matters. By the way, that is a dramatic mistake of the UK. Europe can only be a geopolitical power if it is relevant in its own neighborhood, in the Mediterranean, in North Africa, and in fact, in the whole of Africa. We are far too little of that today. Today, one human being in six lives in Africa. By 2050, that will have risen to one in four. And by the end of the century, to more than one in three. It means four billion people, almost as many as Asia. A huge potential or a huge threat for us and for them. On the short term, 270 million are threatened with famine, famine as a result of COVID-19, making 2020 the worst year in terms of humanitarian situation since World War II. The European Union can only play a geopolitical role if it acts in unison. It is already doing so on trade, on climate, Brexit, sanctions against Russia and China, but more is needed. It should also not be the case that one country prevents us from having a common European position. If necessary, treaty should be adjusted for that. Europe can only play a role in the world when it is internally strong. 
everything that strengthens our internal cohesion also strengthens Europe's position in the world. And Europe can only be a, a, play a role in the world when our societies are stable, when people feel better protected against all kinds of threats, such as those that have been coming at us one after the other over the past 15 years. When Europeans become more people of hope, then we are strong and not people of fear. The European Union cannot play a role in the world if the populists in large countries come to power and block the path to greater cooperation and integration. That role in the world should not be seen only in terms of power, although we in the EU still think too little strategically and often and have often been naive thinking or hoping that others will eventually have to accept our values. Here too, we are changing. We are losing our innocence. We have to think more about our interests, but we also should not forget our specificity. A community of peace, of political democracy, and of eco-social market economy. That is what makes us special. That's what makes us exceptional. Geopolitics must also be guided by that, not to impose that model on other countries, but to support those values around the world. For that matter, we must also defend these ideals within the European Union, within the European Union itself, just as the United States must do it internally. To conclude, we live with our societies and with our civilizations in a time of transition, but no one knows where that transition will lead. In times of uncertainty, in times of uncertainty, therefore, one must stick to one's principles, to one's raison d'être. That is what I propose to do. Thank you so much.